Hello and good evening. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with the author of this book, which I must confess I have read and can tell you it's really good. Uh, not just as a book of history, not just as biography, but a story of the last century. And it's incredible because it's all the seismic events of the last century, almost. I mean, there were many more seismic events even after the 1980s and 90s, uh, are in this book. And honestly, till I read this, although I've read a little of the Gunnar Pandit here and there as a non-historian, just as somebody who sees a book and reads it, I didn't, I hadn't realized that one person could have been in every one of those things and had such an incredible tapestry of a life. So thank you very much for finding all this. Also, the, um, you know, of late we've been thinking about what an archive means. And in many of the conversations about what an archive is, we've felt that uh, there is a lot that's getting lost because we are not, not many people are writing what's happening. Not many things are being uh, preserved in writing. And many things like, you know, like uh, th through technology, they tell us that we could actually have a hole in history because technology could make much of it disappear if we do everything only through technology. So seeing how important it was to find these, you know, to use these archives, to have the archives in the first place, and for you to go and look at every bit of paper, not just of one archive, and not just about one life, but about, about many things that made up that life. So, and if this sounds hyperbolic, read the book. And then we can have a conversation. So uh, I actually have no business being here because I'm not a historian. Um, I'm not any of the things that should equip me to be here. But I'm delighted nevertheless. Uh, today's lecture is going to be around the book. I think you'll be taking a lot from the book. I'm also hoping that you'll take a lot, take something at least from your previous book, which led you to this book. So um, this is just a formal introduction. Uh, Professor Manu Bhagwan is a specialist on modern India, professor of history, human rights, and public policy. And I can see why you would be interested in Vijayalakshmi Pandit. He's at Hunter College in the Graduate Center, the City University of New York, and senior fellow at the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. He's the author or editor of eight books, including the critically acclaimed The Peacemakers, India and the Quest for One World. He says in his uh, introduction that this is what led him, working on peacemakers led him to this book. Uh, and most, of course, his, re his recent book, Vijayalakshmi Pandit. We have with us also Geeta Sagal, as we have other members of the family who we are delighted to invite here. Uh, I think it must really be a moment of great pleasure for you, and it's, it's fantastic to have a person like this in your lives. Never mind if they are a few, you know, generations away, but I think it's fabulous to have them. Uh, so Geeta Segal is a feminist human rights advocate working on religious fundamentalism and secularism. That is, she works on it, not... Yeah, so she spent nearly 40 years in the UK involved with the black feminist movement, opposing racism and fundamentalism. I think many of us here know her work. She's a member of the editorial collective of the journal Feminist Dissent. She's also a filmmaker who's made films on dowry murder, sati, forced marriage, war crimes, blasphemy, and apostasy. So we'll begin this evening. It's a real tragedy that Nantara Segal couldn't be with us. The intention was that she would be here. But uh, I think maybe at least in part the virus that started floating around in our midst again, it didn't seem like wise for her to travel. And so Geeta has come. She will read out for us Nantara statement. Uh, it's not a statement. It's you know, Nen what Nantara has to say. And uh, then we will have Manu speak to us. After which there will be a discussion between Manu Bhagwan and uh, Geeta Saigal in which I have promised I will interfere and interrupt. For now, Geeta, will you
everybody, and my most sincere apologies that I am standing here in place of my mother. I know many of you came out on this cold winter evening in order to hear her speak, as well as, of course, hear Manu's lecture and uh, learn more about this wonderful book. Um, and I have to say that two days ago, she stood at a podium like this, and we do have pictures, and you will one day hear her in her own voice saying these words. Uh, and she said, I'm not well, but I'm my mother's daughter, and so I am here. And I also have to say that the reason she's not here is not because she desisted, but we, her daughters, decided with her, but uh, we, we decided that it, it really wasn't safe. And in the state of her exhaustion, in which she might have been willing to continue, and with um, gatherings becoming again possibly more dangerous, uh, we thought it wasn't wise. But we have filmed the event, event in Dehradun, and at some point you will hear her. But um, for, to, for tonight, I'm going to deliver her remarks. Uh, I'm very happy that Manu Bhag Bhagwan has written a biography of my mother, Vijayalakshmi Pandit. He has brought her forth again into the limelight. Her life and achievements and all that people need to know now and may have forgotten in all the years that she had been forgotten. I have to tell you, I'm a great and passionate admirer of both my parents who did the right thing without turning a hair. The right thing. They never told my sisters and myself that this is the right thing to do. We could make up our own minds. In fact, we followed the example of both our parents. Long after my father died, my mother carried on the same tradition of being open with each other, not So what was the right thing at the time? We were ruled by a foreign power, Britain. I grew up at a time when the map of the world was painted pink. Pink for the parts that were ruled by Britain. The British Empire, of course. But under the leadership of Gandhiji, it meant making our own way on our own terms. We have forgotten the lessons of Satyagraha that Gandhiji taught us. It was not only that the struggle was important, but the fact that it was nonviolent meant that many women were able to join who might otherwise not have done so. Gandhiji called upon Indians to act, free of the control of the British government. He meant that we were not free, but we should behave as, we, as if we were. A great, almost countrywide movement happened. The salt tax, as you all know, was opposed. And for many thousands, or hundreds of thousands of Indians who opposed British rule, it meant dissociating themselves from institutions and dissociating, uh, you know, in all kinds, courts, schools, colleges, and so on. Both my parents went to jail, and I remember my father being taken away by the police. My mother, who was expecting him to be arrested, had made a chocolate cake for tea so that we wouldn't be entirely bereft. That is why I called my first book about my childhood, Prison and Chocolate Cake. My mother had always been at the forefront of the political struggle for freedom, along with many other women. She was imprisoned three times. It was a very brave thing to do as she was separated from her children for many years. It must have been hard for a young mother. It certainly was difficult for her children. We were taught to hold our heads high and be unafraid, to never cry when dozens of police came to arrest my parents. I remember how many came to arrest one lone woman who was nonviolent and was not resisting arrest. We didn't cry in public, but it was difficult for a small child to do at times. My father died of his many imprisonments. My mother had pleaded with him many times to ask for his release, but he refused repeatedly. The last interview he, she had with him in jail, he was brought in on a stretcher to the superintendent's office. His head had been shaved. He was skin and bone. She was utterly shocked. If I remember correctly, she disobeyed him and asked for his release on health grounds. But she had no time to mourn as a widow. With only daughters and no son, she inherited none of her husband's wealth. 
years later, she attributed the passage of the Hindu Code Bill, at least in part, to her ordeal when she was widowed. Her brother had told her, I hope you're not going to wear widow's weeds. And of course, she did not go into private mourning. But as Manu's biography shows, worked in the Bengal famine and went to America to represent India's call for freedom. That launched her on a whole new career. But for her, it was a continuation of the ethics of the struggle to which she had given everything and to which my father gave his life. Gandhiji sent her to America because we needed someone to represent the cause of India's freedom, as the British had their own Indian delegation. And she did it spectacularly well, as you will find out if you read the book. If I think of their legacy, I think of their courage. They were from well-to-do families who could have spent their lives in absolute comfort and had everything they wanted. I also remember her sense of adventure, which was encouraged by her brother, Jawaharlal Nehru. When she made one of the most difficult decisions of her life to publicly oppose her niece, Indira Gandhi, during the emergency, I was her advisor and counselor. I had joined the JP movement, which had attracted followers from the right and left to challenge the growing trend to authoritarian, personality-ruled government. Of all the family, we were the closest to each other in our political thought. She would grieve at the India we are becoming. But I hope that reading about her life, lived in a time of imperialism, war, and fascism, people young and old will draw inspiration from what she did and how she did it. I want to end with a poem that my mother taught me. And as my sister and I know, she recites this poem every few days to us. Mourn not the dead. Mourn not the dead that in the cool earth lie. Dust unto dust, that calm sweet earth that mothers all who die, as all men must. Mourn not your captured comrades, who must dwell, too strong to strive, each in his steel-bound coffin of a cell, buried alive. But rather mourn the apathetic throng, the cowed and the meek, who see the world's great anguish and its wrong, and dare not speak. Thank you so much, Geeta, for that moving tribute. And thank you uh, so much, Dr. Ramanathan, for that kind introduction and for your work more broadly and for being here today. Um, I am so very grateful to Nayantara Segal um, for all that she has done for me, for this book, for her remarks in absentia. And while she is unable to be here in person this evening, her spirit and the radical courage and fierce determination that animates it clearly fills this hall. This evening has been made possible thanks to the tireless efforts of so many, some of whom are, are here with us this evening. Um, Ruchira Gupta, Kei Tei Tukwang, and Gita Sego have worked wonders to put all of this together, and I thank them. To the, I also thank the IIC for hosting and to all of the center's support staff, sanitation workers, and security crew for looking after all of us. I'd also like to express my thanks now to Manjuri Mehta and particularly to Nonika Sego and Gita Sego for arranging this event and for the unyielding support they've given me during this entire process. Good evening, distinguished guests, dear friends, old and new. Thank you for coming. I'm honored to be speaking today about the pioneering life of a remarkable woman, 
or rather, in the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, the most remarkable woman, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. Her reach, I have discovered, extends far and wide, finding its way even here into this very room, touching each of us. Many of you in attendance might have known her personally, of course, but also the India International Center was itself designed by Joseph Stein, who came to India facilitated by the architect Richard Nuerka, and none other, and none other than Mrs. Pandit herself. Stein's family have written to say how it was especially fitting, it is, they feel, that she be honored here t tonight in one of his buildings, they said, what goes around comes around. My talk today is based on my new biography, eight years in the making, based on research in over 40 archives from seven countries across continents using material in five languages. It has been a labor of love, and I am pleased to now have the opportunity to tell the story of this iconic Indian in full for the first time. Vijay Lakshmi Pandit was born in 1900 and lived until 1990 a long life that stretched from her involvement with the subcontinent's struggle for freedom to her career as independent India's perhaps most recognizable face abroad. Her story is therefore intricately intertwined with that of her country. And, though, and through it, we also tell the story of India and the world in the 20th century. She was born into an aristocratic family and grew up in Downton Abbey-esque surroundings. Her upstairs-downstairs run home in the city of Allahabad called Anand Bhavan, the abode of happiness. Sarup Nehru, her name as given at birth, was the daughter of a powerful, gregarious, and extremely wealthy lawyer named Motilal, the middle of three children. She was always closest to her elder brother, Jawaharlal. Nan, as she was commonly known, was a precocious child who was schooled formally by private tutors only up to an intermediate level. But her real education stemmed from her love of reading, facil facilitated by Anand Bhavan's magnificent library and through her intellectually stimulating environment. Luminaries of all kinds filtered in and out of the house, and she herself began international travel from the age of five. The family grew close to Mohandas Gandhi soon after his return to India from South Africa in 1914, and through the bond they developed, grew ever more involved in politics. While Nan found such matters interesting, the early years of her life were devoted to family affairs and to romance. This caused a fair amount of heartburn, and she was steered into more traditional choices by her relatives. She married at the age of 20, and changed her name to Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, taking her husband Ranjit's patronym for her own. Association, association with Gandhi dramatically altered her family's lifestyle. Jewels, silks, delicately woven tapestries, the finest china, all gave way to rough, hand-woven clothes and social upliftment work, especially for those from marginalized caste communities. By 1930, she entered prison for the first of three times, and through that fiery experience, emerged tempered and steely, ready to do battle. A truly extraordinary, indeed cinematic, life followed as she became one of the world's most celebrated women of the 20th century, one of the world's most recognized and respected diplomats. Several moments from throughout her life really stand out. When she was still but a small child, she and the rest of her family were accorded a special honor by King George and Queen Mary. Later, when she was touring Europe for the first time, she was picked up by the police for the attempted assassination of Mussolini. Back in India, as tensions mounted, she faced down angry, violent mobs, forcing them to disperse, merely with the force of her personality and the power of her words. In the late 1930s, she not only found herself in Czechoslovakia during the Sudeten crisis, 
but also squarely in the middle of things, with Lord Runciman staying right next to her. Shortly thereafter, she stood outside 10 Downing Street as Chamberlain declared peace for our time. As you said, a personality that appears everywhere throughout the 20th century, or, or as I like to say, the Forrest Gump of the 20th century. <clears throat> In India, she battled famine and disease, <coughs> even to the point of personal collapse. She served as a key intellectual founding force of the United Nations, and later was instrumental to the resolution of the Korean War. She became so beloved and so famous that ordinary folks like taxi drivers in the United States sang her praises. Even the incorrigible Winston Churchill was won over in the end. She worked with the likes of Bertrand Russell and Robert Oppenheimer to prevent nuclear disaster. And back in the United States, she told, Presi and she told President Kennedy, don't go to Dallas. And then, and then, she resisted fought against and helped defeat her own niece, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, to end her authoritarian emergency and restore democracy. Eloquent, glamorous, brilliant. She was the first cabinet minister, first woman cabinet minister in India, the second in the British Empire after Margaret Bonfield, and the first to wield substantial power in matters of self-government and public health. She was elected the president of the All India Women's Conference, where she tried to push it from elite concerns to more people-oriented ones. And from there, a host of breakthrough positions. Member of the Constituent Assembly of India, India's first ambassador to the United Nations, India's first ambassador to Moscow, the first woman ambassador to the United States, the first woman president of the UN General Assembly, additional appointments to Mexico, Ireland, and Spain, member of India's parliament, high commissioner to the United Kingdom, governor of Maharashtra, representative to the United Nations Human Rights Commission an extraordinary life. But this synopsis should not give the impression of hagiography. While her career was remarkable, she faced many challenges, had many ups and downs, and did not always make the right decision. All as befits someone charting a new course. She battled depression, fatigue, and several breakdowns, sometimes publicly, sometimes privately. She was loving, but had a sometimes rocky relationship with members of her own family like her sister Betty and her sister-in-law Kamla. And while she was lauded for her prowess in the West, she was nonetheless eventually iced out as her brother's closest counsel and confidant on international matters by her long-standing rival and nemesis, V.K. Krishnamenon. My work attempts to present Vijay Lakshmi Pandit in all her complexity, balancing a focus on her professional struggles and achievements with concern for her personal trials and triumphs. It is in the fullness of this picture where we can see her affection, courage, and talent, sharpened by ambition and temper, that we can better understand what it was for this pioneering woman of substance to sometimes be dismissed for being all wit and charm. We can see more clearly what it meant for someone who lost all access to her wealth when she was widowed to sometimes be criticized for her expensive tastes. And through such insights, we can better appreciate her contributions, not only to India and its foreign policy, but to the making of the post-war world itself. Vijay Lakshmi Pandit possessed a cosmopolitan outlook from early in her life, and it informed all that she did, gradually evolving into a distinct internationalist vision she spent her life trying to make reality. To illustrate this, I turn now to a series of readings from my new book, four episodes in total. The first of these takes place in the late 1930s and involves her election to the UP State Legislature. Episode one. This is now a reading. In late 1936, about a year after her election to the Municipal Board, Nan was selected, along with Ranjit, to run for a seat in the state legislature, now made possible by the Government of India Act of 1935. While she was enjoying her work at the local level, she could not resist the challenge the new position presented. Difficulties, opposition, criticism, these things are meant to be overcome, and there is special joy in facing them and coming out on top. It is only when there is nothing but praise 
that life loses its charm, and I begin to wonder what I should do about it, she recalled about two years later. She was about to get her wish. Nan was slated to run in the Kanpur Bilaspur women's constituency, facing off against Lady Srivastava, whose husband worked in the Viceroy's Council. Like most others opposing the Congress candidates, Lady Srivastava was a powerful elite who generally was pro-British, or at least accommodational, and backed by money. While Nan herself did not lack for money or clout, Congress candidates, by and large, were underdogs, easily outspent by their rivals. To compensate, they had to engage in granular politicking, to spend time with individuals and communities they were hoping to represent. Nan's constituency was a rural one and very spread out. Standing for this election was altogether different from her previous experience, where she was able to contest from the comfort of her own home. Now she had to plan extensive travel, with days away from Anand Bhavan. Accompanied by several male colleagues, Nan set out by a Ford car, which had seen better days. Nan's first night on the trail was spent in a little village. After dining with the locals, she was escorted to her bed, which was laid out in a tidy school right next to those of her companions. This shocked her, since she was wearing a coarse cotton kabi sari and usually slept in something much more comfortable. But there was nowhere private to change. With nothing for it, she laid down and fell right to sleep. The next morning was hardly better. She discovered she had to bathe with one's clothes on in the traditional open-air manner of the Indian peasant. Again, the thick kadi got in her way, and she felt the task of cleansing herself this way difficult. But Nan was determined to make the best of things and to adjust as necessary, her experience in prison having prepared her for life beyond the comforts with which she had grown up. She came to love life on the road and the people she met along the way. She instantly connected with each of them in a personal way. That night, she spoke with Ranjit by telephone. His constituency was Allahabad itself, so he remained at home with Jawaharlal. When she told him that she had slept with the boys, since she had no other place, he roared with laughter at his wife's predicament. While Nan, Ranjit, and other, cons and other candidates concentrated on their specific races, Jawaharlal, now known widely simply as Nehru, traversed the country encouraging people to vote. He called on them to treat a trip to the polls as a pilgrimage and to resist temptations offered by those hoping to shore up the existing system. He declared, We go to the legislatures not to cooperate with the apparatus of British imperialism, but to combat the act and seek to end it, and to resist in every way. British imperialism, in its attempt to strengthen its hold on India and its exploitation of the Indian people. The competition was fierce, the Times of India noting unusually large numbers of candidates in the field. Very few incumbents were returned unopposed, but Sir J.P. Srivastava, the husband of Nan's opponent, was among them. In late December, an objection was raised to Nan's candidacy in the hopes of derailing her chances, but nothing came of it. Voting stretched out over the first two months of 1937. Polling day in the United Provinces, where the constituencies of Nan and Ranjit were located, was slated for February the 8th. As predicted, the opposition candidates, that is, those representing the establishment and status quo, offered rides to polling stations and luxurious food and drink as rewards. But the people turned away from this, not to be fooled, and instead cast their lot with the insurgent Congress. Surveying the landscape, Nan recalled herself thinking, these are the people of India. They, and they alone, will give the final answer. I will never forget this day. How right Bapu is. We must never forget them. Congress won major victories throughout the country in eight out of 11 provinces, and so were invited by the governors to form ministries. As, as, soon, as, she learned her own, as soon as she learned her own fate, Nan dashed off a telegram to her children, who were at home in Anand Bhavan with Swarup Rani and Bibima. Upon receipt at mealtime, Chandraleka tore it open and read, Yes for Mummy. She and her sisters looked at each other, bewildered. Suddenly, Leka, as she was known, shrieked, Yeah for Mummy. It means, Yeah for Mummy. 
Mummies won the election. With amusement, Nayanthara later recalled the incident and explained, resigned to our use of American slang, picked up through their time at the American Woodstock School in Missouri, Mummy had obviously thought, yeah, would be the most apt way to announce her victory to us. And the telegraph office had, of course, changed the word, thinking it was a mistake. We dropped our forks and joined in a wild dance around the dining table. Nan herself swelled with pride in what she personally had accomplished to a degree, but more so for her country and for its people. Alas, for us and for India, she reminisced regretfully de decades later, we keep forgetting them, the ordinary people, letting them down when personal opportunity beckons us, running to them when their aid can tip the political scales in our favor. In every crisis in India, the faceless multitude has rallied to uphold the great ideals on which our civilization has been based. But in the continuing crises in their lives, what have we done, the so-called leaders, the educated, the upper classes? This next excerpt takes place in the United States in early 1945. She is about to embark on a speaking tour of the country and meets with a leading talent agency to discuss the parameters of her appearances. Episode 2. Nan sat down with Clark Getz in late January. He and the Walshes were in regular touch and had been informally discussing possible tour arrangements. The need for a formal speaker's bureau to handle her itinerary had grown increasingly apparent in the short time that Nan had been in the country, as invitations and inquiries seemed to follow each of their various engagements. After her evening with the regional Indian community in early January had produced the finest reports and a lot of positive behind-the-scenes publicity, representatives of the League of Nations had even reached out to Walsh to ask if she would speak in Toronto. This had been regretted as she did not have permission to travel to Canada. Getz had a sterling reputation and his agency had represented many prominent speakers. His interest in Nan was testament to the drawing power he believed she had. Even so, he had allowed his vivid imagination to get the better of him. He started to inquire about what kinds of colorful saris she intended to wear and asked where she was keeping her jewels. Americans, he told her, channeling P.T. Barnum, would expect to be dazzled by the exotic. Please understand, Nan would l later recall, she told him, that my husband has recently died under tragic circumstances. My brother and the leaders of our freedom movement are all in jail. I have been able to come to this country almost as a refugee to tell people the truth about India. The story of what is happening must be told, and it is so dramatic that it needs no props. I do assure you that I am a good speaker. I can reach my audience. They won't bother about my clothes or the absence of jewels. Please let me do this my way. She had one further stipulation. She would not speak in any forum that excluded African Americans. There would be six potential topics, what kind of post-war world, the four freedoms for Asia, democratic guarantees of peace, the hope for world betterment, why India wants independence, and the coming of Indian democracy. Getz put together a one-page promotional release, which featured a headshot of Nan in a dark sari looking askance. That's the picture on the cover of my book. One of the most important women of our time, the brochure read, notable for her great ideals and deep personal sacrifices for the benefit of her people, Mrs. Pandit's influence is felt not only throughout India, but throughout the world and her strength will be felt even more widely in the post-war years. Devoted to the general betterment of mankind, along with the improvement of political and social conditions in her own country, Mrs. Pandit is an ad ardent advocate of democracy. She feels that only democratic institutions and complete freedom of thought and expression can win the peace and successfully manage the problems that will follow the war. And that freedom is the truest sense, that freedom in the truest sense, is the only security against a recurrence of the present catastrophe. This third excerpt takes place at the top of 1947, just months before India's independence. But here, the angle is quite different. The focus is on the response to her debate at the United Nations 
where she had just won a resounding victory in response to South Africa's discriminatory domestic laws and defeating the renowned Jan Smuts in debate. Episode 3. The American black press and race justice activists savored the defeat dealt to white supremacy. The New York Amsterdam News wondered on its front page how South, Af how South Africa would save themselves from isolation in one world now that they had been handed such a humiliating setback. The paper noted that all comers, even the deceptive and hypocritical Sir Hartley Shawcross, um, brackets here, one of the most distinguished uh, judicial minds in the world at the time, who had just um, been the lead prosecutor in the Nuremberg trials. Sir Hartley Shawcross and Charles Fahey, parentheses, the American Solicitor General, even the deceptive and hypocritical Sir Hartley Shawcross and Charles Fahey were no match for the brilliant and silver-tongued oratory of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. The paper called the victory one for our side in an editorial, evocatively writing that racial Jim Crow had been blasted as out of line. They celebrated the stand that the diminutive and charming Indian delegate, who they noted had broadly identified herself with the struggle of all colored peoples against discrimination, had taken against the full battery of American arrogance, English chicancery, and their boot-licking stooges. It now remains for us, they wrote, and for all who believe in one world, to work that first step out to its fuller conclusion of justice for all men everywhere. The Atlanta Daily World headlined a front page story, Madam Pundit leads fight for minorities, and noted that she was also urging Negro unity for independence. They ended with an observation and a plea. Mahatma Gandhi's admonition for his countrymen that freedom is not a cheap commodity may wisely be shared with the American Negro. Rise up, O oh men of fortune. Writing in the Chicago Defender, W.E.B. Du Bois, the leading black intell intellectual of his day, declared that, quote, every Negro organization in the United States ought to send an official note of thanks to Madame Vijayalakshmi Pandit, adding that she should be known to all persons of African descent as the leader of the successful assault upon the color line. He observed that she had not confined her attack, that she had not confined her attack to the Indian problem. Rather, she repeatedly spoke of the situation of the natives and the disabilities under which they labor. He praised her for her unselfish and courageous attitude and wrote that he hoped that it would spur solidarity and a more united front against racial injustice everywhere moving forward. My fourth and final excerpt takes place in 1941, prior to the last two readings. I've situated it here to allow Vijay Lakshmi Pandit herself to have the last word. Episode 4. The 16th session of the All India Women's Conference, the leading national women-led advocacy organization at the time, was held in late December 1941 in the southern coastal city of Kakinara. In entering the name of her cousin-in-law as president for the coming year, Ramesh Sri Nehru began the meeting by highlighting Nan's signature achievements to date, heralding her as the most popular minister in her province. She is well known for her tact, for her discrimination, for her grasp of things, and for her ability to work with all kinds of people and in all kinds of situations. She knows how to ta tackle difficult problems and in her dexterous hands, they become easy of solution. It is her capacity for hard work which has given her the position in public life of the country which she holds today, she said in praise. Other opening remarks were just as laudatory, if not more so. Margaret Cousins declared that Nan's presidency crowned with success all that Cousins had fought and stood for over the past decades. A princess from a small local Zamindari state, Yuvrani Vaidbati of, Hitha, of Hithapuram, then in the same capacity that, na, that Nan previously had, formally welcomed all the delegates to the conference by drawing attention to global events. 
The All India Women's Movement is not an isolated movement. It is part of a great world movement. We are seeing with what heroism and strength of conviction our comrades, the women in China, Russia, Britain, and America are facing the cruel vicissitudes of fortune. In all likelihood, we may have to face a similar fate, she noted. Now the time has come when we are confronted with problems that are not limited to the exclusive spheres of the woman or the man alone. They belong to the common humanity and demand a solution. Perhaps the perfect solution will never be possible in the sphere of human activities, limited as the human being is in his intellectual and physical capabilities. But nevertheless, a solution of the problems is an imperative need if a belief in a better future is to be maintained. This conception is not utopian. It is practical. It is an effort, a great and worthy effort. Disarmament, greater peace, a more sensible economic rehabilitation, and a better and more equitable distribution of the world's natural resources, a more human view of science, education, and art are all factors in that effort. Nan's keynote address, delivered shortly thereafter, echoed many of these sentiments. She, too, drew connections to women around the world and to organizations fighting for interrelated causes. The great forces arising in the world today, she said, will ultimately help shape the new world, in, in the new world which will come into being after the war. It is in planning for a new world order that women should take their share. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, a partner organization with the AIWC, has declared itself in favor of a world order based on a new attitude of, of man to man and nation to nation with a realization of interdependence and a renunciation of exploitation and profiteering. But declarations to be effective must be implemented by action. Nan continues, we must decide whether we shall ally ourselves to the forces of life or those of death. Shall we raise our united voice in favor of a brave new world where human life and human liberty receive the respect which is their due, where progress and security are within the grasp of each individual? The future, not for women only, but for humanity as well, is what the women of India make of it. Today, woman faces the world as an individual for the first time. Her problems are the problems of society. And while fighting for those legal, civic, and economic rights, which are still denied to us, let us not forget that the whole question of rights for women is closely linked to the social question, which, in its turn, is part of the larger political question. Nan mildly chastised the delegates for trying to take on too many tasks at once. As a result, they had wasted too much time passing resolutions to no meaningful effect. Nan called on them to tackle one problem collectively over the coming year, illiteracy, she suggested. A mass drive started by the conference would instantly invoke a response from other progressive groups and would help us to establish closer contacts with the villages and with the workers in the fields and factories. By way of ending, she first praised efforts to codify the Hindu law of succession, which sought to address deficiencies in the way women inherited property. She noted that the codification of the whole of Hindu law was urgently required, based on the equality of status between man and woman. Then she closed by appealing to her friends to remove the hatred and suspicion which have crept into our midst. India belongs to all of us, she reminded them. Her greatness is the result of that culture to which each sect and religion have contributed. Her past glory, as well as her present fallen condition, are the handiwork of her children. Some of the work we have done may have value, but if we can contribute even a small measure to the unity of India, we shall not have lived in vain. Now, before I close, a special treat. Education is an urgent necessity. In our country, we are specially hampered by a lack of edu education, and one of the most important tasks which face us today is the education of our people. Towards this end, our government is working 
and seeing the same compulsory primary education on the one hand and adult literacy on the other are materializing with a degree of rapidity which we had hardly thought possible a few years ago. There is much, however, to be done. I would not like you to imagine that we had accomplished anything but a small fraction of what looms ahead. But we are confident that our determination to succeed will help us forward at an ever-increasing pace. Time is against us. We have lived too long in the 18th century and must run if we are to catch up with the 20th. Without scientific techniques and industrial advancement, it is not possible to raise the living standards of a people. If standards of living are low, unrest and revolt must inevitably follow, which in turn may reignite the spark of war which still lies smoldering. In order to prevent it from being rekindled, we must remove the causes which hasten war. Poverty, want, discrimination, colonial rule, these are among the basic reasons of war and conflict. We must direct our efforts toward the ending of colonial rule where it still exists, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, through abolition of all forms of discrimination and by the granting of equality of opportunity to all men and women, regardless of race and religion. There is much work and hard work to be done. Throughout the years, war has been described as a great adventure and death on the battlefield as the highest form of national service. It is my view that the adventure of living is far more noble, more exciting than that of dying, and the highest form of service to one's nation or to the world is to live for humanity and to serve it. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. That was a good introduction to the book, but I think there's a whole load more in the book. So if it's, uh, what we will do now is we will have uh, Gita and Manu in conversation, but we are hoping because there are a lot of people here who know a lot of history, who know a lot of the family, who know a lot of uh, what it meant to have a person like Vijayalakshmi Pandit in public life, life through those years. Um, we are hoping that you know, we'll pass the mic around and if you can, it doesn't have to be questions of course, but if you can contribute to the conversation it will be very welcome. We'll start with the two of you. Thank you, Manu. It's been a pleasure to, I, I mean, I've, I've only just had a copy of the book in my hands in the last week or so, but um, I've seen you develop the ideas through lectures and uh, other means. And I want to, uh, I want to start with um, a couple of thoughts, uh, which I'd like you to bear in mind when I'm asking specific questions, because Sorry, um, am, I off, am I on mic now? Okay. If I'm too close, then I, it starts reverberating. Thank you. Um, so one of the, the, I think, very extraordinary things about your book is your development of the thesis that through biography, not through um, you know, other kinds of explication or, or uh, analysis, is that Vijay Lakshmi Pandit had a distinct internationalist vision, as you just said in your lecture. And in fact, uh, Manu met my mother in the last few days. And my mother has, of course, as you all know, promoted Nehruvian ideas, secularism, uh, and nonviolence. And she said to Manu that my mother, you know, went out and promoted the things that were laid down by Nehru and Gandhi. And you very politely disagreed with her and said she was her own woman. Um, and so I want to try and explore with you why uh, when she was as extraordinary as she was and as well known, I mean, people still know her name even if they know little else, um, why she 
who came from this very elite and articulate background seems also to have been subjected to what the so social and socialist historian E.P. Thompson called uh, the enormous condescension of history. When he was talking about the laboring peoples, the unsung people who left no records or any official records and so on, and how you have to recover their histories and their stories from all manner of sources. And yet, as you found, there's a wealth of information, and yet you really are the first person who's put it all together. Um, well, thank you. Um, it has been a task, it's true, uh, although a, a pleasure uh, to do it. Um, there, there's some ironies in this situation. Uh, at Thien Murthy, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit's papers are extensive um, and constitute perhaps one of the most extensive collections uh, uh, in the archive, save perhaps for, uh, not say perhaps, save for Krishna Menon's, uh, which has just been opened and which uh, I think uh, are even more so. But up until this most recent thing, I think Vijay Lakshmi's was the, one of the biggest paper collections there. Um, and uh, people had certainly gone through it for all manners of things, and uh, sh she would be cited here and there. And, but it wasn't really subjected to serious analysis or taken as uh, a, a source in its own right for the purpose of interrogating her specifically. Um, and why that is, has, um, I, I think, is quite interesting in its own right and complicated. Um, firstly, it has to do with the kind of archive she produced. Um, she was a deep thinker, and so on the issue of what your mother had said, um, Nehru is frequently um, thought of as the, the intellectual force. He's produced all these books uh, on a variety of topics to do with you know, all kinds of things. Um, and so people rightly go to those and, and sort of explicate his, his thought through that. Um, Vijay Lakshmi did not write books of that kind. Mm, she didn't write philosophies or treatises on foreign policies. She wrote a number of books, but they were all experiential in nature about the things that she did, her time as a minister, her time in prison, uh, and so on. Um, she produced a lot of paper, though, and the paper in total matches uh, what many others, uh, what many men also produced. But she produced this paper in the form of letters and diaries, notes, um, and so I think part of this has to and do speeches. And, speeches. And, and, and many speeches. And, and, and part of this, part of the, the the problem of the archive has to do here has to do with the nature of what this is and how easy it is to dismiss this as not being serious, uh, as opposed to these larger tomes. Um, and that I think is a very gendered way of of, of approaching the, this this question, um, because I think that there are all kinds of reasons why one might write in this way. Going through that material took a lot of time, but I found very clear lines of thought, detailed, distinguished, independent, independent of Nehru and Gandhi, and often in conflict with them. And that's really what's important, because it's not that she's just checking a box, always agreeing with them. She disagrees, and in many cases, she disagrees about ideas while they're being formulated. Uh, and so when we track those lines of thought, I find it now hard to say that Nehru or Gandhi are the people, well, not so much Gandhi, but Nehru is so, so much the person who just did this. There's a conversation, an interactive conversation going on between them. And um, I, I, I think there's a very different kind of origin story in terms of intellectual thought here that still needs to be worked out. And my book, in that sense, is just a first step, and there are some people here in the front row who I expect very much to take that forward uh, um, in the coming years. Um, so that's one part of it. Uh, the other has to do with, um, I think, the kind of paternalism and patriarchy she faced throughout her life itself, some of which I indicated. Um, she, uh, when I encountered people who knew her to this day, and some people who worked with her and had memories, um, some of the recollections could often be very dismissive in dismissing her for frivolity, for example. Um, this didn't really comport with what the record I found showed, and so I could really only chalk this up to, uh, again, very patronizing and uh, paternalistic 
uh, kinds of a, um, you know, approaches to things. Um, I'll give you just one example, which is, uh, as you may know, she, was, she frequently wore sleeveless blouses. Uh, and so this one person who was telling me about her career in diplomacy, and that was what I thought the, the discussion was going to involve, said that what her great contribution was, was, quote, that I'm quoting this other person now and, and their recollections, was her fine arms. Yes, exactly. So, uh, and that, that is what she faced in her own life, in the memory of her life, in the memory of her contributions, and that is what ha had to be, has to be overcome. So I think there's all of that part of it. Uh, then I think thirdly, oh, just the two, two remaining points on this issue. Thirdly, uh, I think there's a, a great men school of history uh, which has focused on men and not women. That's a whole other thing. And then finally, of course, there is a, an active erasure that took place because she went up against Indira Gandhi, um, because uh, they led to conflict. There was a kind of purposeful erasure of her thereafter uh, that scrubbed her from the public record, um, even insofar as the history of Anand Bhavan goes. If you go to Anand Bhavan, which she, where she lived and spent so much time, grew up, uh, she's not. She's hardly there. She's a ghost at Anand Bhavan. It's crazy. Um, so I think those are the reasons altogether that you, that I, that uh, we, we find. That. Yeah, she wasn't consulted when it was done on Tin Museum. Anand if Bhavan. you step in for a second, there's a complete outsider to this whole thing in reading the book. I actually found it fascinating that through the book, we see a woman not apologetic at all about being a woman. I mean, in, in a lot of the women's movements that came up after that, we had to fight being, you know, we had to say that, you know, you, you had to, in a sense, have to give up some of what being a woman was for women. And you read this book and you think she, she never apologized for being a woman. She was all woman, hmm. which meant that the way she looked at a problem and you know, it made me wonder what it would have been like if we had had many more women like this. I don't know if such many could have existed, but you know, when she the way she looked at the Bengal famine and what she thought she needed, needed to do, you know, it wasn't just making public policy. It wasn't asking people to do things. She got down to the ground. She needed to keep going back there. She needed to set things up. When she asked people to contribute, she said, you know, contribute so that it can be done because there are children who are lying around with nobody there. People are dying, you know all around and we need to do this. When she went to the Kumbh Mela, her, the way she handled the health crisis, it seemed to have, it seemed very different from what you hear men do. I mean, I was thinking of a number of things. When she went to the prison, uh, she was looking at the children who were there and saying, you know, why are these children in prison? They need something different. And, you know, the idea of working on a garden when she was there, and not, nowhere do you need to see her get out of who she is for her to do what she has to do. When she's at the UN, when she's a minister, it seemed to make no difference. She was, that's, I think that's what fascinated me about this. It was really so different from reading any other biography for this reason. I mean, among many other reasons, but this certainly was uh, one reason. So uh, she did have, plainly she had, you know, it was fa it's also fabulous to see the relationship the siblings had, even when they didn't agree, and even when they had their problems. Uh, but there was no imposition of an idea one on the other. And there was a lot of give and take between Nehru and Vijayalakshmi Pandit, for instance. But that, it's so rich. And the, the kind of public engagement that existed, we, it's this book that tells us how much there was in, the pri in private life too. And how many conversations, I mean, with children, children around you discussing not not India, not colonization, not the British, but the world. And you open it out to the world. The wealth of that, I think we're somewhere we've lost sight of it in much of the history that we, you know, the, the way we read history. And this produces that. And she helped produce it. I mean, if she weren't there, this history perhaps would, would, would have to be said differently. Well, my mother always said it was the men in the family who were feminists. So, you know, having said this, I just have to say, you know, he starts his book with saying this is not a hagiography. What I said just sounded like it was, but it's not. I think it's a biography written with a lot of affection. 
and she produces that perfection. That's the. Um, I, I do want to say that as a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a professional historian, not a biographer, uh, and so when I came to this and I, I started going through the her life story, what it seemed to me I was doing was writing a history of the 20th century. Uh, she lived for almost all of it. Um, and a history specifically of India in the world in the 20th century. Um, what struck me was that I was covering a number of things that seemed very familiar to me. That is, okay, I have to walk through some of the big grand events of this well-known period of history. And yet, in each instance in which I found myself walking alongside her, the story was completely different from what I knew. It, it just read very differently. Um, and it read very differently because who was acting, who was seeing, who was doing and reacting, all was completely, it's not so much the reverse, but just it's an alternate universe altogether of this story we think we know. And that story involves a series of world wars, it involves a cold war, it involves the independence of the subcontinent, it involves uh, the making of a post-colonial country, uh, and it involves international diplomacy, a world order. It goes on and on and on. Um, and so it's striking to me how um, truly seeing, this is, it's, it's like a cliche come true, seeing things through new eyes changes the path that we walk. And on that note, I mean, I, um, listening to you, I mean, when, when you as, as began to talk about some of your findings, I remember very distinctly um, a lecture you gave, and it was actually um, for a sort of cross-country project on global biography, if I remember. And I mean, that you would think might be the perfect place to talk about, um, you know, all her diplomatic achievements and, you know, some of these very big, grand achievements. And you, you gave her um, CV, as it were, in a paragraph, you know, all the first this and first that. And then you concentrated on talking about her time as health minister. And I remember this very clearly because this was, uh, we were on Zoom. You were uh, probably in your living room. Every, the world had closed down. I was sitting with my mother at home. We had been completely isolated for uh, uh, months and months at that time. And uh, the funeral pyres were burning 24-7. And the Kumbela had been declared open. And you talked about how she dealt with a cholera epidemic and went to the Kumbela to deal with that. And my hair was standing on end. So I'd like you to just describe that a little bit. Um, so uh, she's the health minister. She goes uh, to the Kumbela in Haridwar. Uh, and um, she's very excited to go, although. Um, there the are versions of this where she's from, but this feels very different to her. And uh, she gets very excited. And when she gets there, uh, she something about it. She describes it almost as the scales falling from her eyes as she sees a lot of people there with true mission and intent, but just a lot of con men uh, also operating. And she's very wary of that. Uh, so once that happens, she kind of approaches things with fresh eyes, and she. Uh, gets down to business fairly fast. She, she warns people of cholera. She's herself protected, and she starts to you know, try to take some protective measures. But even with the protective measures that are taken, both for herself and for the place at large, cholera begins to spread very rapidly, and people begin to, to pass off. Uh, and uh, she basically then, I mean, the, the cholera spreads everywhere. It's a terrifying moment. People are dying. They're you know, in, in wide numbers. And she grabs the people in charge of the minute, the, 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 her staff and marches right in to the most deadly areas trying to you know, get people the need and assistance that they want. It's an act of supreme courage. And she doesn't just do it once. She does it for an extensive period of time. She has some protection, but what is some protection against cholera at that point, especially with you keep getting overwhelmed by it? Uh, and so um, she works herself to sickness. The sickness is not cholera. It's total, absolute exhaustion, which itself can be quite deadly. Uh, and she helps to 
contain it and to push it back. Um, and it is, it is quite, a, quite a feat. Um, it, is a, it is a personal effort by a health minister and to, to push back and contain a public epidemic. Um, and it's, it felt like it was speaking to the present as we did that in the middle of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. I think uh, in every other page of this book, I mean, Manu has really recovered her voice. Uh, my mother had uh, her brother's letters to her, Nehru's letters to her in her possession, and she edited and published those. But we didn't have the answers, and the answers were scattered through various places. She didn't have any research support. She's not a scholar. She did use the archives, and she did um, build something up, but she was always looking mostly because her personal information was what came to her, that is, Nehru's letters inward, as it were. Um, and so it was wonderful to actually recover my grandmother's voice and to see, to see what she said in her own voice at crucial moments. And so one um, uh, er area that I just want to go to, which you referred to, um, the aftermath of, you talked about the reaction to her victory at the UN General Assembly, even before India had become independent, when she led a debate on South Africa and defeated General Smuts. Now, this is, a f this is not a story we didn't know. I grew up with this story. I grew up, and I'm sure all of us will remember, um, that she had done this debate and she de defeated Smuts. But the, the spin, as it were, or the, the, the version of the story that we heard uh, was that Gandhiji had said, uh, you must conduct yourself uh, without insult. You must be polite to uh, smarts. We are opposing him, but he is my friend, and you must always conduct yourself with honor. So this sort of Gandhian spin, as it were, was a, of the ethical, of ethical conduct was the chief thing that I uh, embraced or carried away with me. Uh, for years and years and years. And it was only when I read actually your book, The Peacemakers, where you discuss this in some detail uh, uh, about the founding of the UN and uh, Vijay Lakshmi's role in the founding of the UN, but also uh, in this debate. And also uh, talk about Hansa Mehta and other remarkable women who were involved with that process. Uh, but uh, it's only then and I'd worked in human rights in an international organization for years, and we had spent years discussing universal jurisdiction, and we had spent years discussing whether, I mean, Western human rights was conceived very differently with a very firm disregard for economic and social rights and an embrace only of civil and political rights and only conceived in certain ways and so on. And uh, yet, at the founding of human rights, there were other conceptions of it. So hum both human rights in general, but also this idea that one state could not only defend itself against aggression, but was able to raise a moral argument against the conduct of another state towards people living in its territory. I won't say citizens, because many of them were explicitly non-citizens or were being made non-citizens. And of course, they'd been aware of this because of colonialism on the one hand, but also fascism on the other. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how do you take that forward? I mean, in the biography, because of course she was involved, not just at that debate, but for a considerably longer time, in, uh, both in South Africa itself, in the question of South Africa, but also other issues of where you actually speak to the words of the Charter, to the, to the intentions of the UN, rather than uh, deals that are done, realpolitik deals between states. Um, I think this is the, one of the differences we can see between a biography and an, a, a, a monograph, a thesis-driven book like my previous one, The Peacemakers. So in that one, I was making a claim about India's internationalist vision and foreign policy uh, and what it hoped to accomplish on that stage. And I followed this series of sequence of events that sort of led from one place to the other. And it, they followed on one another. Um, what you're asking here is, so here is one of the actors and, they're, and they have this pivotal, they play a role in this pivotal moment and it has an impact. But what is the teleology of thought of action that brings her to that moment and then what happens thereafter, after this pivotal moment. 
And does she continue to, how does she intersect with the, the changes that have been wrought? So that's what I'm able to do in this biography, which is you can follow this in all kinds of ways. So to the point you're asking uh, about, a, there's a couple things there. Um, so uh, the first is that the great achievement of her life was this moment. She recalled this about two decades later in a BBC interview with Mark Tully where she was asked to describe, pick one thing uh, that was the time of her life. Obviously, there are important things that happened after this moment of the interview, but at that moment in the 60s, she, d she, she declared uh, that uh, this, what she accomplished in 1946 was the singular achievement of her life. Um, and it was because she goes to the United Nations, which is the new, and she previously gone to the United Nations as part of the South Af Sa uh, San Francisco Conference to help establish the new institution. There she'd gone at the urging of W.E.B. Du Bois and Walter White, the NAACP, and she'd gone to lead a counter-delegation to San Francisco. Um, as part of that counter-delegation, she articulate, art articulated then an alternate vision for what the UN would be, and she came, she confronted mm, British officials who had a different kind of perspective. The British officials won, and they won by putting in a certain kind of language into the charter. Uh, that language was um, delicately phrased, so it was a bit ambiguous. They, they celebrated that ambiguity because it allowed for what they wanted, which was the continuation of colonialism under the language of trusteeship. Uh, she felt she'd lost, but she came back at this and then turned that logic of ambiguity on its head. Ambiguity in language, whatever the British intent might have been, meant that you could also interpret it in the way that how they got away with it, which is it meant there were possibilities. So she used that to articulate a much wider, celebratory kind of vision and pushed back then against South Africa on that basis. South Africa had passed a series of discriminatory laws, uh, and she was trying to uh, challenge those. She did that by winning a two-thirds majority vote uh, in the General Assembly, which was celebrated. And then I talk in my remarks uh, about how the black press and W.E.B. Du Bois specifically then recognized the value of that achievement as smashing white supremacy. Um, but that specific moment of victory wasn't just a vote in the General Assembly. It established a precedent. The precedent was that the United Nations or the international community had a right to intervene in the affair, domestic affairs of states, uh, and that Article 2.7 of the new UN Charter didn't prevent that kind of domestic jurisdiction clause. So that's the specific kind of consequence of that. That opens the door to all of human rights. Uh, the Human Rights Commission, when it's then created shortly thereafter, um, is charged on the basis of the fact that this precedent has been set by her um, uh, in, in the debate uh, just prior. But now having established that, then there's the, okay, great, the UN can intervene and now we develop something called human rights. And then there's what happens, there's the reality of the Cold War. Uh, and different sides have very contesting views as to what a right means, what which right is acceptable, which isn't, and it turns out that a lot of that can be chalked up to power politics. They, they just get, they, they're defined by, pushed through um, um, power politics. So she has to navigate those things, um, and so while I think the Peacemakers lays out a claim about policy at a very a sort of intellectual level, um, this is about the reality of how you implement those those views, uh, and it comes face to face with poor decision making, with uh, people who say one thing and do another, uh, etc. Coming to the bit because you spoke about human rights, and I was thinking there is, we know that right now that all kinds for some time now we have this uh, idea that human rights are something that has come from the West and is being imposed on us. But everything I read in the book said that she had thought about it, uh, spoken about it, advocated for it. And I was thinking the idea that colonizers and the imperialists would be looking at human rights and not those who had been colonized now seems so absurd after reading uh, this book. But that prompts me to ask a question because you know there's a lot in the book where you uh, speak about patriarchy. I don't know if you ever encountered the, wor the word patriarchy in any of those uh, documents that you saw. 
uh, I just wondered, in the way in which you've written the book, and the way in which you thought about what you were reading, how much do you think was influenced by what we're seeing around us now? I don't mean that it, anything is an anachronism or anything, but then you know the, the language that you give to it, the way in which you, the way in which you interpret what you think is being said. Do you do you think it had any role at all? I know you you know you're you're trained and you perhaps tried working your way out of it. I was just curious. Uh, all history speaks to the present. Um, historians, our work is to. Um, think about the past in the context, the lens of what we do. Now, there are schools of thought. There's a, what's called a presentist school, which makes this claim. There's people who disagree with that. But any work which has, to me, meaning speaks to our present. It can have a long life. It can be written in a way that the, the notion of the, the nature of the present can be can have a durability. But it must, it must, it must be able to speak to the now. Um, I, I will say, uh, with the there is a moment which I'll, I'll just illustrate here um, to say that I, I definitely did that and purposely. It's meant to speak to the now, um, and again, a long now, not just a moment of this of this particular second. Um, but there's a moment when she is a minister and she goes on the radio um, and she gives the most remarkable speech because um, so uh, in the field of women's history uh, as it has developed it in at least in the West it, it grew out of a specific article mm -hmm. by a scholar named Barbara Welter who wrote an article called the cult of true womanhood that famous article then grew into a, a phrase that we call the cult of domesticity, widely known. Uh, the cult of true womanhood talks about uh, the several key values uh, that women were expected to adhere to, and, most of, and they were relegated to the domestic sphere, the, the sphere of the home. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's what defined a true woman in the Americas in the 19th century. And from that grew co the contemporary field of women's history in the West, I'm sorry, in the West. Um, I'm, re I'm looking at this speech mm. by Vijay Lakshmi Pandit in the 1930s. Sorry, Barbara Welter, who wrote that article, I I is my mentor. Uh, she recently passed away, but I worked with her. I knew her very, very well. Um, and I, and I, uh, I value her work, her contributions, and I adore her as a person. Um, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit in the 1930s, somehow she's speaking on the radio using language that's so strikingly similar. Mm. I, I, I couldn't even believe it as I was listening to it. I was li listening to this, and then I thought I might have like crossed my wires and gotten <laughs> gotten something that, as I reading as reading about the speech. Um, so there is, it, it, it's not just me mm. making that connection. It, it is there, uh, and I was struck as I was reading it by how much uh, the story speaks to the present, independent of my intention. Uh, it just it just feels very relevant. And timely. So I'm going to come back to this sometime because I do understand that the past speaks to the present. I want to know how much the present spoke to how you read the past. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, because I just, you know, like I wasn't very sure that this really fitted into the rest of your narrative. Uh, it has placed here, but when you're talking about FDR's four principles, which is freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. I felt it was today making you speak about some parts of that period, and that you would. That's maybe I'm reading it like that because that's what I'm seeing. But I just wondered, should we send it around and then we can come back to put a few features in? Mahabir, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Professor. Uh, you know, it's very interesting you talk about the neat erasure in the first place. I remember seeing a photograph of Mahatma Gandhi on the one side, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, the other side, Indira, then Indira Nehru. The photograph that one has seen, that's a rare photograph. The one I've seen actually is with Mahatma Gandhi and Indira Nehru, you know, as a child. 
Uh, no, you're talking about the international outlook. My question actually relates to her years. She was the first Indian ambassador to the Soviet Union. Uh, but during the two years that she was there, she did not uh, even once, for some reason, get to see Stalin. And I'm wondering what might be the reason for that. And the reason, of course, why I'm raising this issue is that the Kashmir issue already had gone to the United Nations Security Council. And the Soviet ambassador, the head of the UN, UN actually opposed the issue being brought to the UN Security Council for obviously their own reasons. But the fact of the matter is that the international outlook uh, and the environment being what it was, I'm just wondering why at that early stage we weren't able to make good use of the Soviet attitude towards the Kashmir issue. It was left to Dr. Radhakrishna, the second ambassador, who went there, who actually met Stalin twice. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so I do deal with this question in the book. Uh, why she doesn't meet Stalin. Uh, it, yes. Yes, so I, I do deal with it in the book, um, uh, at, which is, I'll, I'll just sort of answer this uh, kind of broadly here. It's a very specific kind of question that you're asking. Um, but I'll say, number one, I do, I do kind of get into this a, a good bit. Uh, her time in Moscow was um, not as unsuccessful as it is made out to be um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, she sets up the Indian presence there and has to develop an embassy from scratch. Uh, this requires a whole lot of groundwork. She's treated uh, as few other ambassadors are, as a matter of fact. She's, get, she's given a much better treatment than most other ambassadors in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, and I have records which show that the Soviets, and this is from Russian archives, by the way, uh, actually thought quite highly of her, um, e enormously highly of her. Uh, and they also respected her work at the United Nations, pushing her in a variety of ways. They pushed her then, and they pushed her afterwards, after her tenure as, as ambassador to the Soviet Union ended. Uh, uh, and they backed her for a number of things, including, I might add, for her position as the first woman president of the UN General Assembly. So I would say that it is not true that her stint at, at, uh, in Moscow was just completely wasted or, or unsuccessful. Having said that, in her own words, she felt that she was not able to be as successful as she had hoped and, in fact, for the most part, felt that she was treading water. She felt that way for several reasons. One was that... Um, while she had great hope for what um, the Soviet Union stood for and she and her, many of her staff admired uh, the, the country, um, she found herself at odds with the way diplomats were restricted and with access to information that she could have. So that juxtaposition kind of led her to a place of discomfort um, and uh, that was one part of it. Uh, she also grew disillusioned fairly quickly uh, and uh, just generally was quite unhappy in the position uh, in, this, in, in the initial phase. As far as the specifics of what happens with Stalin, uh, I do get into it and I have records which indicate exactly what happened. And you can have a look at the book and make your decision as to whether or not you find that convincing. Thank you. 
thinking um, and uh, knowing that we are going to be listening. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first question is fabulous. I love it. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, uh, I uh, am not sure about the answer in a, dis in a direct way. What I can say is that, sh so what happens is that uh, Vijay Lakshmi is married to an incredibly wealthy uh, person, well, you know, fabulously wealthy, runs a pundit, and she herself is very wealthy. They bring wealth together and have a lot of assets. Um, he dies while he's in jail, and he doesn't have a will. Uh, and because he doesn't have a will, it falls I into the, it, th there's some contestation here. She believed when that happened that it was a relatively easy mistake to fix, uh, that you know, she could just go and get a kind of sign off from the state and proceed. What happened is that her husband's brother uh, contested uh, this uh, issue and claimed the property entirely as his, including all of the property that she herself had independently of her husband. So he took everything. Um, I'm not sure, I don't have the answer as to the why that particular act wouldn't work, but I would tell you, I can say that the, one of the greatest legal minds of the day, she hired to fight her case, Bej Bahadur Sapu, and uh, she, she sued uh, her brother-in-law. She, she, she was going to court, uh, even though she believed and Sapu believed that she had very little chance of winning. So I, while I can't speak to why this, why she, I, I'm sure they would have known, but I, however it played out in their specific case, it didn't look viable. Um, they were gonna go, she, he was gonna make a case and he still was gonna prosecute, but then the other issue was about how long and drawn out that process might have been and the cost of that kind of battle with family for the children. Uh, and she was really of two minds of this. Uh, she wanted, you know, she felt she was wronged and she wanted to w win, um, but she had these, she, she, she sort of went back and forth. Could, could she bear breaking relations between the children and um, her husband's side of the family? Uh, and she was, although she had been originally counseled, also kind of back and forth by Nehru and Gandhi, ultimately they said, just leave it. Uh, and she went along, it was her decision. She wasn't forced to make that decision, but she went along with dropping the case. Uh, so that's what I can say. That I think you're onto something absolutely marvelous, and I hope, hello, um, these, are, these are some folks who are working on these kinds of things uh, moving forward, that they, that they might take this forward, or perhaps you, that you might. Uh, and, and that's your first question. This was when her husband died in 1944, so that's yeah. like seven years yeah. after the 1937 act. Yeah. And she was already in, you know, she was already in very much in public life. And I'm astonished that Nehru should have allowed this, you know, this sort of thing at the state. Well, the, the again, the, the Hindu court bill was already being discussed. But he was the right uh, to you daughters and not the right to widows. So I'm just saying that it's worth, yeah, you're right, it's worth exploring. <coughs> It's, it's worth remembering this was during the Quit India movement. Yeah. Nehru was held incommunicado for long periods. Uh, you know, they, they were not in a position where they were sitting around a dining table discussing legal strategy. She was dis disinherited immediately of property and money and left with nothing. And he, I, I mean, he wrote to her or said to her, my mother says, I, d I don't know the source, but th this is from my mother. He, 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 she says that her brother said, never mind, we can always earn our own living. We can write, we have means of earning our living. We we'll just have to earn our living. And it was Gandhi, as is told in the family, who really didn't want her to fight the case and said, don't fight your relatives. And she agreed, and I must say, I grew up hating Gandhi for that decision. And then years later, realizing what it means to fight a case, it takes a lot out of you. And had she been fighting that case, she may never have done the work she did in the Bengal famine. She may never have gone to America. She may have been tied to court appearances in India for the next 20 years. So in the end, actually, I think he was wise, not in, in, in terms of advancing women's rights or claiming rights, as you're arguing they already had, but in, in 
being that she was disinherited, but she was free to rebuild herself and to fight for a cause, the cause that was closest to her. So it's a silver lining you're saying. But just a little footnote, if anybody explored this, is also she was, uh, you know, she was with the All India Women's Con Conference, and they were fighting for property rights. So she wasn't alone in a way. And you're right. I mean, she had other priorities. But but I think there still begs the question: What did the other women in the All India Women's Conference, the WIC? I mean, it was the biggest teaching that the women's movements in the 1940s were fighting for: the the right to property, apart from the right to vote. So, so I can add just to that. Just uh, I can add two things to that very quickly. The, the specific point: I know that she found it galling uh, that she was in the position with the All India Women's Conference. This is something that they cared about. This is something that they were advocating. So she was also pushing it through that organization, and yet she was struggling in this way. But I think the context of what Geeta just said is the answer. And in addition, the the issue with the the, the tension with the family, like you know, you don't want to break the family and all of this. So I. Ultimately, I think that's that's where it, it goes. Uh, she was planning to fight, and she did have an eminent lawyer on her side. He also hired an eminent lawyer, um, but Bob did. So it was a, a complicated case. You asked a second question, why didn't she go to university? She did not only not go to university, she did not go to school. She, she did not go to school. Uh, she was privately tutored. Now, as a matter of fact, funnily enough, Nayanthara, just this past week, uh, just a, actually day before yesterday, uh, she said, you know, my mother didn't go to school, and it was the best thing that ever happened to her. Uh, because schools at the time, not in Nayanthar's view, uh, pushed a certain kind of agenda and boxed people in in the way that they thought. She, she didn't have that. Uh, instead, she had private tutors who kind of gave her the same kind of thing, but she was much more free to push back. Uh, and she did because she had access to the library at Anand Bhavan and, and all this. Even that, she only went up to an intermediate level. I do go into it in the book as to why she, why, why did Motilal not go further in thinking about her education? Why didn't he push it and so on? Because he was a supporter overall uh, of, of the women in the family. And there were many active and, and progressive women in the family. So I do go into that and explain that further. Um, but I also want to point out that she ultimately received a university quality education through the life that she lived. And the proof of that is that she ultimately found herself in debate uh, and in um, verbal conflict with some of the greatest minds on the planet and defeated them repeatedly over and over and over again. In, uh, in, and so I don't think that her abilities uh, were in any way uh, diminished by not having that university education. Oh, and she also received a number of honorary university degrees from the most eminent institutions in the world, um, a, a, in India and the world, as a matter of fact. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for writing this book because at a time when so many voices of women freedom fighters have been erased. So it's wonderful to have this um, book. I uh, look forward to reading it. I am very curious to know, you have researched four archives? 40. 40. Over oh 40. <laughs> okay. So that's phenomenal. What was her response to the idea of partition? Um, Prior to partition. Yeah. Uh, she was, you know, very concerned with uh, communal divisions. She felt they were completely wrong. Uh, she had a fairly good, if complicated, relationship with Jinnah. Uh, she, at one point, thought, firstly, that uh, she was ready to accept him being in a position of leadership. This is at the cabinet mission stage, uh, when the Muslim League says no, uh, and things sort of fall apart from there. But she was kind of ready at that point, I write about it, uh, to go along with that. She later thought that the Congress was uh, not amenable enough to alternative ideas. Um, and I think she, as she always did, just sort of looked at things as they were. I don't think, you know, she sort of said that the tragedy was in the horrors of it. Uh, but then, you know, she got on with it. We have a, we have a, a neighbor, neighboring country and we have to have relations with them. And she believed in 
advocating India's point of view, as she had to. Uh, and from that point forward, she uh, that's exactly what she did. Uh, while she was in the United States, Pakistan sent ambassadors, uh, or they, sorry, not ambassadors, they, they sent, uh, I mean, uh, like arm, and I mean ambassador in the lowercase a, they sent representatives uh, to come to the country um, and uh, speak on its behalf. She had very good relations with her Pakistani counterparts at that stage. Uh, I mean, I think she regretted the violence of it. I don't, I don't know, I, I mean, as it was the lead up to it, you know, I mean, I think she was distraught. To f she, she would refer to things in letters and comments as the troubles. You know, she was very troubled by how things were uh, poisoning the atmosphere and things of this sort. Obviously, her whole goal was unity. So she was looking for ways out. I mean, I, I, the, the way I can best describe this is to say that she, I don't, I didn't come across things where she's specifically saying partition is the worst thing ever. She doesn't, she doesn't say it that way. She just doesn't comment in, in those, in anything direct. She criticizes the communal flare-ups, the idea that people can't live together. She, she absolutely disavows the historical interpretation that these were historically and um, that these were communities that were historically antagonistic. She would have rejected the two-nation theory. I mean, they're two separate things, isn't it? The idea of partition as a, as a political reality, as, as various forces pushing for it, and the idea that the theory is based on is a valid one. I think she would viscerally and absolutely reject the that's two-nation theory. That, that's in there. She did say no. Yeah. 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 She, she did say no to that. Perhaps take a last one and then uh, come back to Jason. Oh, sorry. Okay. Here we go. Uh, thank you, Bhandi. I am from Bhutan. Um, so I think the question is very valid. Um, one of the what led me to write a biography on Madhu Sabha. So I think uh, rightfully so, I think Madhu Sabha. Um, it's a very Um, but at a time when um, India took a path of being appropriated by different political parties for their own gain, how do you consider the voice of someone as important to our existence to include their family towards Madhu Sabha's work? Here, not just us, like a lot of scholars here, a lot of family members here, or the people who actually delve into an academic book like ours. Um, how do we take their ideas beyond that? Um, it, it's just some, something that I thought about when I was writing. Um, okay. Do you want to take a few questions? Sure, yes. that's fine. Then we will have the other. Yeah, please. Oh, so I, I'm, I'm introducing myself. I'm Rashmi Sehgal. And I just I wanted to share that, you know, I was the last journalist who interviewed her. Uh, I was working then for the Independent, and I had traveled to Dehradun to meet her, and we had a, shared a long conversation. <laughs> the interview was published in the Independent, and uh, it, she did a very, uh, it was a half-page interview, and it was very widely quoted. One quote that she, one sentence that she said was picked up by several other newspapers. Uh, India does not belong to the Nehru. She said that. She also uh, spoke, uh, you know, in a, I don't, I wouldn't say that she spoke very critically of uh, Indira Gandhi, but she did kind of sum up uh, her relation with Indira Gandhi as well as, uh, as, you, as what she thought about of the emergency and the way democracy was evolving in, in, uh, in our country. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad that to meet you and, uh, and that you were able to do that interview. I did focus a little bit uh, at the very tail end of the book on interviews she did at the last stages of her life, um, so I'm, I'm happy to speak to you afterwards to learn a little bit more. Um, to your questions, how did I write this by? I guess this is, this is, my, this is the end, right? Are we finishing here? Or, uh, I mean, uh, you could go on, but they'll cut you off. I said, okay. So, um, 
The answer is, um, okay, I'll answer you by telling a brief story, if that's okay. Uh, so um, I've been a professional historian for uh, quite a while, um, and um, I was already in my current position at Hunter College in New York. Um, and I was sitting at my desk, and a, a colleague walked into the door, walked into my office through the door, and uh, presented me with a book that he had just written on American race relations and the world. And he presented to me with a lot of pride, and he, uh, with a bit of bounce in his step, and he said, then he handed it to me, this will be of particular interest to you. <laughs> and I, I received it, and I was happy, and I was interested in the subject of American race relations and the world, but I didn't understand what he meant as to why it would be of particular interest to me. So I asked him, and he said, well, because Madam Pandit, Madam Pandit, <laughs> Madam Pandit, he, and he tapped on the book, and I had no idea what he was <laughs> talking about. I hadn't put that together, and I sort of nodded politely, and I uh, went to go look, uh, and I realized, oh, he's talking about Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, who I did not connect with the term Madam Pandit or the UN or anything else. And I vaguely knew the name, but I, as I was looking this up, I, I, I realized I, I, didn't, I just didn't know anything about this person. And it was very embarrassing. Uh, it was like, well, here I am, a historian of South Asia, and I don't know anything about this person. Here's my colleague who's just walked in. He's written a book that involves her, and I don't know. And it, it's a moment of real humility. You have to take uh, – embarrassment can be a very good thing if you accept it as this point at which is it, it is an admission that you don't know something. Um, and you have to be okay by saying, I don't know it, and I have to learn more. Uh, and so that's how I took that. I was ab deeply embarrassed. I was quite mortified that I didn't know this. But I said, well, I don't know. What can I do except now use this as an opportunity to learn? Um, so I thought I would read a little bit more, and I did. And then I just sort of put it aside. I was in the middle of a project on uh, ideas of making India, the ideas that went into the making of modern India. And I was uh, conducting research at Dean Moiti, uh, and my angle was my first book, which dealt with Baroda, um, Manubai Mehta was featured there, and that led me to Hansa Mehta. So I get to Dean Moiti, I'm dealing with Hansa Mehta's papers as a sort of leaping off point for this project, and I get to all of her work on the UN. I was astonished. I didn't, again, know all any of this stuff. UN, human rights, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I checked to see if there was anything. I didn't find anything. And that led me back to Vijay Lakshmi. Uh, so I started dealing with her papers, uh, and that grew into my book, The Peacemakers. Uh, when I finished The Peacemakers book, I was quite happy with it, but I had this gnawing suspicion that as, fa as much work as I had done for that, and I had done a lot for that, that I'd only really just found the tip of the iceberg. There was something, there was something really remarkable about this person, and the story was way beyond what I had managed to uncover for that book, which was, again, a monograph. Uh, at any rate, I put that aside. I, had, uh, I was in the middle of yet another project. I was writing about a different kind of a thing, and I, I started work on that. And I was working on it, working on it, working on it, when I was in my home, uh, and I turned to my wife, who's here, and, um, and, and I said, you know what? And she turned to me and said, yes. I said, you know, I'm working on this thing, um, and it's, yeah, it's interesting, but I, 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 this is not what I really want to do. What, what is it? What do you? I said, what I really want to do is write a biography of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, and I would love to do it for Penguin. Oh, darn. Unfortunately, they left. Um, uh, and I would love to do it for Penguin. Uh, and she nodded politely, and thinking I was kidding. <laughs> and that was the end of that. Uh, so I went back to work, and about uh, a week later, a little over a week later, I received an email out of the blue from Penguin, and Ranjana, who sent me that email, was here, but she's left, uh, out of the blue saying, hello, we're from Penguin. Would you possibly be interested in writing a biography of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit for us? Uh, that was completely unsolicited. True story. Uh, and it, when I got that message, I said, uh, well, the universe has clearly spoken that this is what I meant to do, and that's how I found um, and then to your last point, uh, which if I understood correctly, um, how does she live in the world today outside of an academic book? Is that right? Um, well, I would say that's an easy one. That's really up to all of you. 
Uh, you read the book. You make up your own mind. You feel how he speaks to you. Uh, and, um, and then you take it from there. That's out of my hands. Um, uh, I, I think um, I have tried in this work, and um, as uh, Usha and Gita have said, uh, to let her speak, uh, but also to provide a lot of context. Um, and there are other people who knew her who also speak, people who knew her who were her friends, and people who knew her who were not her friends. They all speak in the book. I try to provide a really full, holistic, well-rounded picture that takes into account her critics and gives them space uh, so that you can see her I in her whole reality. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's up, it's up to people to decide and make of her what they will. You know, I will say just on your point, you will ask, or someone, someone mentioned this about, oh, it's women, I think it was over here, women freedom fighters are not remembered. You know, I was thinking about this, by the way, at Veradun as well. Um, children in this country, at least a, a while ago, or when I was young, a long time ago, I might be dating myself, um, grow, grow up using Amar Chitra Kata as a, as a kind of first entry, as a helpful entry. It's a, it's a kind of, a, it provokes the consciousness in a variety of ways. And uh, I, I, there was nothing about her in any of those. In fact, the number of things about Indian women modern Indian women is very slim, if any. I, I, I couldn't think of anything. I looked it up before I came today. I think there was one very recently in which she's one of two characters in a book, one of two featured people. She doesn't have her own book. Um, and I mean, I think that's really reflective of the state of things, of why people don't know and what, what, the, what all this is. It's, not, it's just a comic book, obviously. But those comics are the ground. That's, that's the ground. Things build up from there. So if, if she's not, a, you know, if women uh, don't have the space in those settings, um, you know, we set the stage for erasure all the way through. So I do hope that with this as a first salvo, we recover space, not only for voice, the voice of Vijayalakshmi Pandit, but also for all of those whose voices have contributed to the past in the making of our present and only through which the, com the comprehensive understanding of which can we truly know where we are today, why we are here, and how do we go to much better places when we move forward. Thank you. I think the voice of the author of this brilliant book can only be uh, succeeded by the voice of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. So I think Gita has kindly offered to read an excerpt from the UN General Assembly, from her speech in the UN General Assembly on South Africa, and we'll stop it after that. I don't think we should have another voice after we hear Vijay Lakshmi Pandit's voice. So I'm sure many of us today are wondering, what is the point of human rights? I mean, what is it all about? And given what has been happening at the UN and indeed on the ground all over the world, and uh, of course, many eyes are on what's happening in Gaza and uh, all, all through uh, occupied Palestine. Um, and as we know, of course, the term apartheid has been applied in various different ways. So not only racial apartheid as expressed in the South African case, but apartheid in the um, Palestinian case based on um, uh, not, not, not on uh, race, but on a uh, uh, combination of ethnicity and uh, sense of belonging, partly based on religion, but not only because, of course, Palestinians uh, are themselves of all religions. Um, and then it's also been applied and, uh, in fact, developed uh, legally, theor theoretically, by an international human rights lawyer, K Karima Benoun, who's of Algerian-American uh, or origin. Uh, whose father and grandfather and so on fought in the Algerian war. And she's applied the term gender apartheid to what's happening in, uh, well, in various countries, but particularly to uh, Afghanistan under the Taliban. Um, and I think all these are things which the UN um, has failed to deal with adequately. But I think listening to the words that Vijay Lakshmi Pandit spoke um, in the debate with Smuts, they jump out at me um, 
as having absolutely contemporary res uh, uh, resonance. And what she did was, as, as, as uh, Manu explained, that she was debating some of the most qualified and um, cleverest, most experienced lawyers and prosecutors in the world. And basically, they wanted to kick the case into the long grass. They wanted to send it to another court. They wanted it to sit somewhere else and be judged. But she challenged the UN, the member states, to stand up to the principles of the Charter. So she said, I want to carry the assembly with me in these matters, which I submit are common ground. If I do as I must, unless the 54 nations assembled here place on the Charter a meaning and significance far below what its words convey, what its spirit demands, and indeed what we have asked the world to accept, then the issue no longer rests with India or South Africa, but with us, the nations of the world assembled, who have taken upon themselves the defense of the law of ethics and morality of nations. Therefore, I deliberately refrain from entering into legal and meticulous arguments, which is one way of defeating lawyers, refusing to fight only on their ground. Uh, the essence, going back to VLP, the essence of the South African case is not the denial of law and, and, and the practices we complain on, but on the other hand, its assertion that segregation and discrimination is essential to the maintenance of Western standards of life that the presence of Indians and other Asiatics and all non-Europeans is a threat to Western civilization. Western civilization is not confined to any continent, and on the theory of the Union government, that's the South African government, its, its defense essentially demands segregation as part of the world's social system. In other words, the ghetto is to be legalized as part of the world's stable organization and of this assembly. And then Manu writes, these last words echoed across the state chamber and stung deeply, the significance not lost on any who had come to grasp the horrors unleashed by the Axis during World War II. We must create for the United Nations the abounding confidence of the common people in it and the defender of justice, public law, and morality. That is what I ask you to do. Thank you. Thank you, good night, and with hope for 2024.